introduce uh, Leon Kri. It's a very big pleasure, uh, Leon, to have you here tonight. Uh, you have to know it's the last and final uh, see, lecture of the series this semester, Strong with Classicists. It's also the only one we did here in this uh, big auditorium. We tend to have it as a very intimate uh, event, but uh, for some reason the school organization did not allow us to use the intimate space upstairs, <laughs> so it's here. Um, so, well, I hope you don't mind. Uh, not at all. For us, to have Leon Creer here, I think, was extremely lucky, I have to say. We were very happy uh, he accepted uh, our invitation, uh, or was even showing a minor interest in, in our train of thoughts. Uh, perhaps in the first place, because of course, in the studio, in the semester, and also in this set of lectures, we were interested in what is the classic, uh, to what extent uh, do you update it today, uh, some positions, as we have seen, try to uh, stretch, I would say, the envelope as much as possible. We consider other practices do the, the exact opposite, feel that uh, to keep it concise and very, very dense uh, is exactly the only way to make the classic survive. Either other people would say, I'm not a classicist at all. Well, of course, we, 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 we think we know what you would say, but at the same time, we have no clue. I mean, our own relationship with your work, I think, started with this very funny drawing uh, you made of the uh, James Sterling shop of architectural ideas. Uh, um, no and, credit. Uh, 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 <laughs> fantastic drawing. Uh, and perhaps was finally settled with, I think, the deeply underestimated project for La Villette, uh, which was, a, I would say, a seminal project in how you could consider city restructuring in all its ambiguity and with a classic mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm an old man now, and proud to be so, <laughs> so I take the pleasure to sit down. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, when, I, when I saw the publications which were sent to me, and they came after I had sort of accepted, uh, I thought they won't understand at all what I'm talking about. <laughs> but then I've been a teacher all my life, even though I didn't study, really. I, I was asked to teach before. I could even start properly uh, studying. <clears throat> because in the 60s, the education, architectural education, was so bad that you had to leave it or die. Yeah. Because anything which was interesting was forbidden. And why? Because of this. Yeah. And now, even the most interesting uh, people of that period, like Ungers and Sterling and uh, the can and uh, <coughs> particularly somebody like Ungers and uh, what happened to him, were all their work was dictated, or even Grassi and Rossi, was dictated by what happened uh, in Germany and in Italy in the 30s. So the question is, when I studied, I did drawings which were vaguely classical. They were more futuristic. I was more influenced by Mazzoni and Maroni and you know, the Italian uh, futurists. What was only vaguely classical was considered as, you can't do this because he's fascist. This was what was done in the Third Reich. So I became interested because I came from Luxembourg. We were anti-Nazi. My parents hated Nazis. And we, I had an uncle who was in concentration camp because he said, uh, children think that there is always somebody greater than Adolf Hitler, who was supposed to be God. And because of that, he went to concentration camp for two years now. So we were not Nazis at all. And here, I was told by my professor in Stuttgart that you can't do this because this is what we did in the Third Reich. So I became interested in what happened really there. And I found it was much more interesting than it was supposed to be. Because some of Nazi architecture was very, very interesting. Hitler was a genius as far as architecture and as a client. He was very talented. He was even talented in draftsmen. And don't believe the stories where they say he was just an idiot who, you know, who couldn't draw and because he was a failed artist, he became a dictator. He was an evil genius. He was a criminal, but he was very gifted as an, as an artist. And so was Speer. And so 
it is very strange when you see something beautiful and I saw these publications which were published in the 30s uh, and they were beautifully produced very much influenced by l'illustration in uh, the French magazine very grand format beautiful things done by criminals so you are not supposed to say this is beautiful because they are, they are criminals but then you are not supposed to say uh, is the same with techniques industrial techniques you are not supposed to like a fox hunt because it was a Hitler wagon it was built for a Nazi, was a Nazi socialist project. And <clears throat> because, of course, the classism which Hitler produced was unbelievably arrogant and very, very large scale. But it was human scale. That's why it looks so big. The problem is with our big buildings, they don't have any more human scale. They have machine scale, and therefore they don't even look big. Or they are not even impressive. They are just boringly awfully big. Now, so you have to, if you are remotely interested in classism, you have to ask you to go through this to understand what happened there. Why is industrial technique supposed to be neutral and good, can, be, can survive and not be accused uh, of criminal involvement, even though the bombs were built there? No, people were not killed, the Jews were not killed with classical columns. They were killed by Cyclone Gas B uh, invented, developed by a Jewish uh, scientist, Haber, who worked for the biggest uh, chemical company in Germany. They were modernist industrial projects. So you have to be very aware of this and so understand why is it that we can see something which is highly involved in a criminal operation as being innocent, neutral, and the architecture it's supposed to be criminal, you can no longer do it. Uh, I became friends with Ungers and you could not talk about that. You know why? Because Ungers had been a soldier in the Wehrmacht and he was involved in crime, but he couldn't talk about it. Like all German soldiers were involved in crime, not just the SS. And so if you have a very a vast criminal act being committed, in the name of what? No, of race and culture and superiority and differentiation with other inferior beings, then there is a trauma which you have to understand. And why something like architecture becomes guilty, while really the instruments which still serve today, who bombard to bombard and got our oil out of the soil under unfriendly countries, no, and we don't know. Oh, no, they are bombing there, yes, because they are Islamists or terrorists. No but we need the bloody oil, otherwise our machines don't function. So it's very interesting. Why then architecture is no longer, can no longer be classical? And not just, not just in Germany, but in the whole of Europe, in the whole of America, there is not a single public building done in the United States uh, or Europe. Maybe it changed 10 years ago, when Bob Stern and... Uh, Tom Beebe started doing classical buildings, but there are no public buildings done in that style because it's supposed to be criminal or it's involved in, in crime. So on the other hand, when you study Le Corbusier, who is now, it becomes very clearly also, uh, it becomes very clear that he was involved in crime. He was, I don't think he was criminal, but he was very, very close to fascism and uh, was even involved there. And now, surprise, surprise, Corbusier changes style very, very profoundly in 1945. And the source, the source for that change is this. It's German architecture, German military architecture. The Atlantic Wall, which went all along from France to, to Norway. It's this architecture done also by Organisation Tot, of which Albert Speer became 1942 the head. This is supposed to be interesting sculptural, uh, Claude Parron, you know, did the church like that, no problem. Um, so what happened? It's still not uh, very clear, but um, I think that the future, there is much more future in classism than in, in high-tech uh, stuff. Um, and 
you couldn't study this kind of uh, architecture in school. You could study it as history. Palladio? No. 15 and so, so many years. And friend of such and such, and you know all the you write theses and doctoral texts which are <laughs> unspeakably boring uh, and uninteresting. What's interesting in Palladio is not uh, is not that he was friends with, who he was friends with, but is the technology, the techniques and the materials which served to build these buildings no. and which became so powerful and which are still relevant. So it is, I think it was really a criminal intellectual act to declare that traditional architecture and classicism are historical style and therefore they are irrelevant for today. Their historicizing technology is, I think, an intellectual crime. It's like saying you can no longer speak French because it's a historical language. German. Why can you speak German? Because it was used by criminals. Yet, you know, millions of people speak. So it is this historicization, historization of technology which served to build human scale buildings and cities which I think needs to be understood. And the result of this is that we have deconstructed not only buildings and architecture, but also cities, landscapes, and the like. Uh, Siegfried Gideon wrote a book called Mechanization Takes Command. It should be really that we take command of mechanization. Not that it takes command over us, but that is exactly what happened, because uh, modernism is a phenomenon which would not be possible without the phenomenon, the, the, the major actor in modernism is, and in our ways of life, are fossil fuels. Without fossil fuels, there is no modernism. You can do none of those stupid buildings you see out there. You know, the, the buildings which kind of dance around like there is no tomorrow. Uh, and for no reason, for absolutely no reason. The building, I thought that was the School of Architecture with the crazy tower, it made me think of uh, Pier Gentini, who was you know, involved in the project and just showed. Uh, he said, modernism is to make the easy difficult through the useless. He didn't know why these buildings should be so complicated and so boring after all and not, not being really worth staying there. No. Um, so it is something to do with fossil fuel and fossil fuel, the energies provided by fossil fuel have rendered us, so to speak, drunken. Uh, James Howard Kunstler wrote a book called The Long Emergency. You must read that book. If you only read one, don't read the Bible, read the, uh, the long emergency because you will understand a lot of things about our ways of life and it is that fossil fuel which changes scales of cities and our lives now <clears throat> so it is really this, this world of uh, horizontal and vertical cul-de-sacs which is the modern world which is about to collapse it has already collapsed. I mean, the energy which is needed to provide this demands now that we carry out wars which are unbelievably violent to secure uh, uh, fossil fuels. Um, there's a joke about Bush saying, it's not our fault if our oil is under Iraqi soil. It even rhymes. No. You have to understand that mentality. To and that we are involved in this enormous crime, even though we are innocent, but we still live that way. And so we are part of that. <laughs> so what happened here, do we have an, a pointer? Hmm. No? Somebody has a pointer. No. A very long stick. <laughs> Can you see my... Ah, ah, great. You see, uh, this central... Ooh, 
central Paris, Himgard, famous cities, if you're interested in classicism, Brive, La Gaillarde, my project for Luxembourg, Le Corbusier, Boo. Vienna, the socialist housing, Karl Marxhoff, and Speer's Round Square, Boo. Blast. I'm waiting for them. Now, all those are drawn at the same scale, and Berlin uh, Berlin 19th century. You see already the start of mechanization, of some forms of public transport which begins to blow cities apart, like Barcelona, the famous Barcelona block. And then Corbusier, the completely blowing apart of the urban fabric, and then the zoning, and the spreading about of single functions, which uh, forces us to use every day. Thank you. You have to push. Ah, thank you very much. Very large amounts of fossil fuel. I wouldn't be here without this magic petrol. Um, now, when you look at what happened to cities under that influence, there are two major influences. One is of course, power and one, one is human power and one is um, uh, energy, fossil energy. And in a way, if we wouldn't have fossil energy, we would still have slave labor. Because that is what slave labor did before uh, fossil fuel. It was to do our work in very large quantities and feed very large amounts of people, uh, which you couldn't do before. Uh, that was a pre-modern city, let's say, medieval town, could be a Roman town, a Greek town. Uh, the characteristic is that you have a great variety of building lots. A great variety of sizes of building lots and a great variety of functions of building lots. That you may have a monastery next to a butcher, next to a school, next to you know, commercial, cultural, residential, leisure, religious, all these activities happen within one small human-scale compound. And human-scale, I do not use it as a sentimental term, but as a mechanical phenomenon. It's the length of our legs which defines human-scale as far as cities go uh, horizontally and as far as buildings go vertically. Whatever you can walk up ten times a day without feeling totally exhausted will be human-scale. Now that's why I, I refuse to do buildings more than three, three to four uh, stories, because that is what human scale dictates you, or should dictate you. Now, under this enormous uh, uh, power concentration which happened, the Renaissance through the enrichment of Europe, and then the colonies, is that building lots became bigger and bigger. Clients who developed the functions became larger and larger, and finally, in totalitarian systems or late capitalist systems, you have building lots which are virtually without uh, limit, and generally for a single function, where here you had uh, a great variety within walking distance, here you have a great variety within hundreds of kilometers. No. There's a lot of variety. It's the same variety we had before, but spread over very large geographic areas. And it's the same phenomenon which happened in, in, in socialism and capitalism because it was prepared by uh, co uh, colonialism and the enormous concentration use of power and power resources and energy resources taken from other countries. And this led, of course, to the phenomenon of mass production. Now, the problem is not so much mass production as, an, uh, as a phenomenon, but what it does to people's mind. That uh, when you read Corbusier, he is the poet of mass production, of mass scale, of the very large scale. And, uh, of course, not really understanding what, what this force which is behind it. Uh, uh, does to him while he does beautiful paintings, you know, this kind of size, human scale, beautiful, curious paintings. He plans a town which is a total and utter abstraction. 
you know, 24 skyscrapers, 250 meters high, same, same kind of architecture. Uh, it's a complete loss of, of human scale because it's machine scale. And you, as individuals, have to decide uh, who you are working for, who is your client, what is your scale, what is the scale you want humankind to be. Because we cannot change uh, humanity. Uh, architects or master planners or town planners, they cannot change humanity, but you can change what you are doing. It's, it may be difficult sometimes, but it, it can be done, at least to your own satisfaction and to a lot of other people's satisfaction. Now, traditional architecture is different from region to region because of differences of climate, of soil and altitude. And it is these materiological conditions which change the shapes, the colors, the, the sizes and the nature. But it's always within human scale because it's done by human hand. Uh, this kind of architecture uh, is aclimatic, it doesn't know altitude, it doesn't know soil, it's synthetic materials, concrete or steel, are synthetic materials which are only possible to, uh, to massify in large scale because of fossil fuels, whether it's coal or petrol. And it's air conditioning which then supplies uh, no, to to really make possible to live in structures which would otherwise not be uh, possible in, in different climates. So this is really the, the big hydra. It's that which consumes our time, energy, land and air. And it's not going to be the clean cars which are going to solve the problem. The Tesla car is not going to solve it because the pollution is just happening somewhere else. No. And it's actually bought, sold by banks to countries which, like that, make a bit of money, but then they get the pollution. Um, so interestingly, the peak, oil peak, is what we have almost certainly been over, and what Künstler very clearly describes is that it's not going to be a symmetrical figure rising from late 19th century to the peak is not going to be another 200 years or 150 years to come down from it. But the way over the peak is going to be catastrophic, extremely violent, involving us in wars to secure the last drops of oil. Not the last drops, those we can afford. Because when it takes more oil when it takes more barrels of oil to extract barrels of oil, that's when it's going to become very, very extremely expensive and extremely unaffordable for daily activities. So the typology, modernist typology is extremely large, horizontal buildings, very small buildings in very large quantities, as you saw before, and the skyscraper. They are always excessively large buildings with single uses. And they always occur in very large zones, which are without human scale, but with mechanical scale. <coughs> a traditional towns grow to a mature size, and then they duplicate, duplicate because you know, there's only so many meters you can walk every day in comfortable way. So the modern city is really a vertical or horizontal overexpansion of traditional models and then their transformation, internal transformation. A cellular growth that uh, families or, or cities grow like uh, in a cellular way that, uh, and when a cell oversteps its limit we call it cancer. It's a growth which is toxic and which is finally uh, uh, nefarious and destructive of the structure in which it lives. So imagine that uh, you know, this is the, the couple and they make something and then they multiply and imagine they would not grow this way but just by the monstrous growth of their form 
they would collapse. And that's exactly what happened to cities. So this is a model uh, which cities grow, that small towns, large towns, are a number of small towns. Uh, Paris is the best example of still surviving, or Rome, of having many, many 21 arrondissements, each with four quarters, uh, for large, making a large city. And some people never travel in their life the same. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be the model of the future. That whether it's going to be great concentration of small towns or dispersal of small towns, but that's the only model which can survive uh, a real serious fossil fuel crisis. Uh, the idea of zoning, you know, instead of zoning cities, you, you have on Mondays, you, instead of having so many uh, meals per week, you only have drinks on Monday, only meat on Tuesday, only fats on... Uh, the individual is dead by Sunday. And that is what's happening to cities. Um, then there is the other phenomenon. The historic city, what is called the historic city, is not historic because it's old, but because it has reached a mature form, a mature size. Now, this structure, this very precious structure, which we call historic centers, are a limited size, a limited density, and a limited meaning. They are such producers of value that immediately they call upon themselves the parasites who are going to destroy it because they are going to, you know, the, there's so much wealth accumulated there, and just by doubling the height of building, tripling or quadrupling, who are going to make a buck. And that's exactly what's happening now. And architects love it. I mean, you know, skyscraper city is just the, the, the coolest thing on earth. But it's an idiotic, criminal form of developing cities. It's absolutely insane. And there is nothing like a green skyscraper. How many ever plants you hang from the balconies? It's an idiotic idea which should be forbidden by law. Because what is a skyscraper city? It's going to end up like that. And then it's not great fun to walk down the streets or live down there, no. Uh, the rich people always live on top, in the penthouses now. But a penthouse is as nice when you are on the second floor, on a two-story high town, than it is on a hundred-story high town. It's no different. There's a beautiful city in uh, Guatemala called Antigua, where there are penthouses on two-story high buildings. It's fantastic. You think you are, you are above the town. That's the main thing doesn't need to be so high. So the idea is to limit not only uh, city quarters to 10 minutes what you can walk across, but also vertically to what you will not be exhausted by. And there is, I don't make any moral difference between uh, good and bad traffic. Private traffic is not bad and public transport is not good. There's no morality to it. Uh, you know, if you have everything is going to be forced to go on, uh, on public transport, we will exhaust the fossil fuel uh, materials. You know, maybe a bit slower, but the result will exactly be the same. The problem is that this produces unthinkingly. It produces suburbia, and suburbia should be the enemy number one of planners and architects, because architects' the only sense of having architects is that they are thinkers who know what the end result of their product will be. I had always this argument with Sterling, because he was supposed to be master. And I said, what if we go on doing this for another 100 years? What will it look like? Ah, oh, you don't understand, you know. Uh, you can't go back in time and so on. Modernity is what it is, and we cannot change it. We can change it. We must change it, because otherwise it's going to kill ourselves. So I'm involved with several projects which are uh, one is a project for the Prince of Wales in, in Dorset, which has now been building for 25 years and <coughs> uh, planned for 30 years and has about 2,500 uh, housing units and over 2,000 jobs integrated within the housing and it's formed of four urban quarters. And this is done with the industry which exists on the ground. We didn't train them to start with. Um, and the idea is to have you know, to avoid this kind of hyper-concentration of values in the center and then dilution of values in the suburbs, but to create these polycentric cities. 
Because this kind of zoning is, even if it's not an unintended zoning, is also a social zoning. And now in New York, it be becomes evident you know, with these pencils which are being built 400 meters high, and where each apartment costs 30 million. And it's insane. It's for, for criminals. It's no decent person can live there tranquilly and looking down on poor mortals. Um, so this uh, was in Palm Braid, the project of the is built in the outskirts of Dorchester, where he owns land, and the regional council had decided that Dorchester will grow into this land, and I became master plan in 1988 for this. And so the idea was to, to develop uh, several quarters, which would integrate all uh, functions of weekly life, let's say, within each quarter. Uh, now, each quarter has to have very clear, that's, those are the principles which uh, I set up, out of experience from having lived in the most beautiful city uh, I could imagine was Luxembourg, where I grew up. And it was like that, that city grew like that because of topography because the plateau was divided by deep canyons and therefore you had several cities. It was impeccable, done by geniuses and fantastic politicians uh, over for seven, eight hundred years. And then something happened which people lost their minds and now they build like everywhere else. My father was always in love with Switzerland. We came here in 19, the first time in 1953. Switzerland was an absolute jewel. There was no war damage. It was the most beautiful country in the world. France was destroyed and we drove through horrible cities being rebuilt in the, you know, with the, the boxes and the poor socialist housing. And Switzerland called up. They felt so guilty not having been involved in the war that now they do you know, kind of harakiri themselves. Uh, and so it's, it's very important that you start to study what, is, what went wrong here and what is beautiful here. It's still a beautiful country and then you have these horrors like this university which is supposed to be a spiritual thing, you know, to, to cultivate the mind. Um, it's not, it certainly is not. So what is important, and these are ideas which are based on what I lived with, but also uh, particularly Ero, uh, Eliel Sarin, the father of the famous uh, Ero Sarin, was a genius town planner who wrote the book Community, Functional Communities, fantastic book. And Otto Wagner, who trumped them all, uh, with his un infinite uh, metropolis for Vienna, which uh, hypothesized this idea that the large city is not just a, a grown, an overgrown small city, but is made of a family of small cities, each with its own autonomy. Now, what I lived in, which I brought to this, was that these geographic dividers uh, do not necessarily need to be geographic uh, accidents, like the Thames or the Seine or the deep valleys, but should really plan for parks and for activities which are not really local. And it's these large building blocks which uh, Hosman theorized before Otto Wagner, but it's these ideas which uh, were necessary before the modern city, but now become necessary out of physiological necessity, not mechanical. Uh, result. And it's these very large building blocks of towns, which are each a town, which sets up a geometry, a metropolitan geometry, which reaches into the countryside. So you have countryside can grow into town, but not be mixed up with the town. It's not the green city. It's cities between uh, a very large parks and sports fields and avenues and so on. And within these very large uh, geometric elements and spaces, there you have buildings which are of more important nature than pure local. Inside each quarter you have local activities and the schools or sports activities, are, uh, very large schools are outside, and then these are grouped. No. Uh, these are grouped. Oh, sorry, I'm lost here. <coughs> so each of these four quarters forms like a small city, but 
it has a its center a high street which links them all together and converges towards the really town center where there are activities which are not again local to each quarter but which are local for the town. And it's that hi hierarchy and uh, which became the main elements which are now called for, for an organization called Congress of New Urbanism. You can look it up, there's a lot of literature and very interesting uh, thinkers. And hundreds and hundreds of towns are being built around the United States of, in that nature. And they are quite beautiful and they are, uh, because they are much more necessary there because American cities have been much more devastated than European ones. Now, uh, employment is dispersed is not concentrated in one single zone, but is dispersed throughout the town. Large buildings on the edge and smaller and smaller scale activity around the high street. And the hierarchy of traffic, the speeds, this is super fast and then slower, and then uh, urban traffic, and then inside the quarters. You limit the traffic speeds not by signage, but by uh, the geometry, by short streets, and so on. There was one good thing I discovered, which I didn't know about Switzerland, is that your roundabouts are superior to anything. The roundabouts which are planned here are absolutely genius. In England they are horrible. Hundreds of signs showing you where to drive like people are blind. You know. But here you don't have signage, because people are intelligent. No. They know where to drive on the round. And they are beautifully designed. I saw them in just coming here from Geneva. So, one good thing about Switzerland. Roundabouts. So this was the final uh, project, and uh, we had built. This was four years ago. We have nearly built most of it in black. Is built. It's now. Now we have reached a kind of uh, alt, really a, a comfortable uh, production, and the, the quality which comes now out is really a, extraordinary, uh, which I couldn't believe in myself. I mean, this is not propaganda. It's just a fact. Uh, this is modern, modern developments, no size to it, I saw it, you know, houses, universities, hospitals, anything. Uh, this is a traditional model. And it's this diversity of building lots, the functional diversity and the metric diversity of building lots, which is a precondition for architectural variety, for true architectural variety. Then you don't need Venturi. You need Venturi when you have to design 5,000 houses, nothing else. And then you begin to play around and make it more interesting. Because 5,000 houses and you know, 15,000 people are terrible, boring, if it's produced mechanically. Then you have to introduce uh, artificial variety. Here you don't need that because you have functional variety which commands you uh, di and dimensional variety which allows you to do different architecture. So, character-wise and size-wise and quality-wise, material-wise. So by <coughs> promoting that human scale, of course, you don't hand this to a, a national house builder because they only use the mass housing. We work virtually only in the beginning with small builders who set up the models and train their craftsmen and becomes really craftsmanship. And people who build there, they love to, to work there. They, they produce really good, good buildings. Uh, and because there are 39 crafts to build traditional buildings, 39 techniques which have to be trained and you have to know in order to make them really uh, stand up and, and sing. When we have zoning, we do not have uh, territorial zoning, but only zoning, the largest zoning you can do is blockwise. That, you know, and if you have offices or Lower? Higher? It's all right. Uh, so they are distributed checkerboard wise. So our zoning plan is a higgledy piggledy uh, polychromatic affair. And it's this polychromatic affair which produces a poly, uh, poly variety um, uh, architecturally. We also decided to have only and only traditional architecture, local architecture which drives architects completely nuts because they haven't a clue about it. The traditional architecture, there are hundreds of traditional architectures around the world 
And if you don't know them, you cannot do them. It's like a language. If you haven't learned Russian, you cannot speak Russian. But architects, they are told there is only one language. No. And then you can do anything. You can build in Beijing, and you can build in France, and you can build in Poland, and everything is the same. Well, a traditional architecture is like that because there are reasons. It's not because people just felt like doing nice things, but because they had to be that way. And if they have to be that way, after a while you want them to be beautiful, because otherwise they become unbearable. So, talking about spaces, short streets inside the quarters and long streets outside, where you want to speed up the traffic. Uh, residential car parking is inside the block and a visitor's car park in the street. And this is inside the block. And these are the garages. And so it's by having the, the clue to interesting towns is not that you produce interesting architecture, it's to have an interesting geometric plan following the topograph or working with the topography as much as you can. Because the clues are in the topography for interest. And you go through these towns, through Morg or wherever, you know, these beautiful towns, and when you see those streets, none of them are straight, because there's no reason for them to be straight. There's not a single straight line in, in nature. Why should we produce straight lines? It's abstract geometry. It's, no. it's not a necessity for, for, for towns. And it's by having interesting building plots that you cannot do but an interesting town. So that's fundamental. Not sell down, because it's a horrible bore, you know, sell down, producing thousands of blocks, all the same, with terrible building type. 30 meters deep, with dark rooms and pits and so on. It's just a horrible mistake, engineering. Yeah. So the block is not a perimeter block a la Vienna, uh, but it's a complex thing. And lots of things happen on the edge and inside. And you get it. It's a variety, a functional variety which creates variety. Uh, large buildings on the edge. Uh, that si single building had been a farm, was extended to become a high tech factory. Then the factory moved out, became a very large kindergarten, then became an, a veterinary. Within 20 years, that traditional building uh, had like several changes of, um, of use. Because that's what life is about. You don't need buildings to move, with cranes and floors to move. It's not, it's not oil derricks, it's not oil platforms in the sea. These must be very economic buildings, otherwise they won't be built. We don't build with kind of uh, corrupt uh, funds. Uh, this is uh, an interesting phenomenon because people who have small apartments want gardens and they rent the plot in this small garden city. This is a real garden city. La Cita Analoga, this is one. <laughs> uh, each lot, each block is, an, is a garden plot and where you grow vegetables and it has the form of a town and surrounded by a wall because there's a lot of wind there and with a temple. And we build those around. And you know Schrebergarten, how are they called? They are the worst kind of thing you can think of, a horrible balustrade, terrible pavilions bought in the garden center and so on. And this looks very charming. Now, uh, this compared uh, a modern a business and industrial park outside London and outside Manchester uh, to traditional towns at the same scale. And you see these buildings, even the modernist research blocks are relatively small. All these buildings here are unnecessarily large. This building here could be divided in 10 different buildings for no reason, for no uh, with, without any problem. Uh, when there are, when you have of necessity large buildings, they must be on the edge where they are serviced by heavy goods vehicles. And so you have also a natural hierarchy of large to small from outside to inside. Because the inside must be the core, the, the, the social and spiritual uh, center of the core. I'm not talking about spirituality in, in any kind of new age sense. Uh, uh, we live in communities which are self-interested communities. Individuals are self-interested. And their self-interest is to live in communities. 
And that's where all the fun and pleasure is. And it's not because we have kind of social utopia, a scheme to make people better. No, that's the way they are and the way they, they want to be. Uh, I have to go a bit fast, otherwise. Uh, just uh, an idea from this, this is the main square in the first quarter, which is a, a more vernacular uh, feel because the outside, the, the small first quarter was meant to be an experimental quarter. It has a village hall designed by John Simpson, famous classicist. And, uh, but with a very monumental village hall, but without any classical apparatus. There's no, virtually no uh, extravagant moldings. We stripped about 50% of it with his agreement. And because it had to be in scale different. There's a scale difference. Monumentality purely by scale, not by uh, emphasis and, and language. So when we have uh, the differences, they're always uh, based on the rational scheme, an understandable scheme, but which doesn't need to be explained because it's self-evident. Because beauty is something which is self-evident. And when you are told that something is beautiful which you find ugly, it's the person who tells you is a fraud. Because beauty should not be explained nor justified. It's overwhelmingly, overpoweringly active. And the artists who pretend that they produce beauty and produce this crap, which is in Museum of Modern Arts, they're all fraud. It's terrible fraud. Boys, you know, these people should not be called artists. They are frauds. There's no art in it. It's just valueless. And the problem is not what they do, but to think that that is art and all the rest is fraud. That traditional art is no longer modern. It's not cool. Um, now, if you have classicism, if you have this organization of the town plan, of the village plan, of the Hamlet plan, of the metropolitan plan, uh, which creates this function variety and neighborliness, then a very simple architecture is enough. You don't need a lot of because the variety is in the building lots, in the volumes, in the, the size of rooms and so on. And I think that the best towns are where you have, you just come back from Florence, it's not all palaces. There's a lot of uh, very simple houses in Florence which are, uh, you know, if the whole of Florence was just palaces, it would be terrible bore. It's a contrast between the monumental and the domestic scale which makes Florence or Rome or, or Athens really interesting. And this kind of exaggerated, completely uh, lunatic and hysterical classism, which killed, killed the thing, you know. Uh, <clears throat> because if that is, if those are the institutional uh, and communal activities and the economic activities, they form, they must not be geographically separate, but they must be married in a very strong bond, physical bond and neighborliness. Now, you know, St. Paul's, or here your cathedral, is a one-story high skyscraper which towers above everything. Uh, these are just boring, the same stuff. The, and always in skyscrapers, you wonder, New York has buildings with the lowest roof, roofs, uh, with the lowest ceilings. Even the flats of Nyarkos are horribly low, you can't touch the, the, the ceiling. Because skyscrapers are not created for romantic reasons. They are an over-exploitation of a building lot, an excessive exploitation of a building lot. So uh, we never make a metric limitation to cornice heights, but only numeric limitations of numbers of floors, because then you get natural variety. You know, the Campanile in Florence is 100 meter high, the Brunelleschi Campanile. And it's five stories when you count the uh, in section. Okay, you get it, I think. <laughs> now, this is the towerless town, this is a tower sick town, and this is a true skyscraper city. Within the three story high limit, you can build real monuments. Uh, you know. The Rotonda in Washington has one story. It's the most important thing. When you think of American politics, you think of the Capitol, no? Or the White House. 
one and two and three stories, and so on. So the monumental potency grows with the less stories you have. Uh, and then those buildings which are must be this, the signage or the, this, the, the main markers of a town must be situated always within the view cone. Don't need to be on axis, don't need to be Beaux-Arts symmetry, but should somewhere be visible. And it is that once it's visible, it, ma it marks your mind. And uh, this is what, it, what was the painting of Karl Lugin before we started, and that's what it is now. The tower was not built because, you know, why does he want the tower? Master planner, he can't do everything. No. So the tower was not built, but it's missing. Um, and this was when it started. 20 years ago, it was very difficult because builders don't know how to build properly, traditionally. And we trained the architects, and they are now these buildings are recently built and they are fantastically, you know, they are as good as any historic buildings. These are the main architects here. George Somare Smith and Ben Pantreath. And we have even now a monument on the main square to Queen Mother, who was the Prince Charles' uh, grandmother. And it's real stone. Is real stone. That's the only piece I designed here. And still, the engineer imposed a concrete pole in the middle, completely useless and dangerous. Okay, don't trust engineers. They think they are the, they, they think they are the elements of progress. They are not. Uh, we are the masters of progress. And we have to stop that progress because it goes right into the wall. That was a project, and this is now a building. And this is uh, Prince Charles with Kun and Terry, and no, studying the wall. We do real wall sections. It's not concrete with stuff glued on it. Yet, the engineers impose, <laughs> Kun and Terry only built massive load-bearing walls until five or six years ago when the engineers have become so powerful now we cannot do structures without the damn steel. And it's an unnecessary cost. But it's imposed by law because there's th this division of, of, uh, of architects and engineers which was really a result of 19th century uh, polytechnic developments. And now they have taken over, and the architects are just the idiots who have to draw what they say. <clears throat> and that's not the worst, but the worst is that they espouse then the, the uh, spirit of the engineer. Because what happened by the separation of structure and appearance is that that is really the domino system, is really what caused uh, either modernist or classical kitsch. And Unfortunately, Venturi, I mean, that's what I think Venturi does, you know, that he just dresses up the thing, but doesn't really address the, the, the problem. He did some interesting, nice little houses, but that's about it. I don't think it's important. Uh, because, you know, you have to analyze what happened here. Corbusier said, this good, this bad, out, finished. All this can no longer be done. Or those who do it are just reactionary, uh, retrograde, uh, they are st stuck in the mud, and so on. Uh, this is what I respond, just as a joke. It's a joke. I didn't mean this. Because, in fact, we have to build this way and then build another wall outside. So it's very expensive. And it also endangers the structures by mixing structures, but that engineers don't get. No, you have to make coherent structures. One of the problems of the, the Römer in uh, reconstruction in Frankfurt was as an engineer imposed uh, a concrete structure instead of having all wood structure, which after 20 years is now uh, showing major problems. Because this is a reality and we have to live with that and we as architects have to really master this because otherwise we are uh, mastered by other elements because this is what 
uh, Venturi used that system in order to glorify it. No. But that's uh, the ugly reality. And it's, it's necessarily producing kitsch. It's fake. Whereas when we produce traditional architecture, because technologically we are now bound, if we build cities, to espouse this conflict and have incoherent structure. And in that situation, it's all the more important that the architect knows what he's doing. Because otherwise, you are permanently making mistakes. Because the structure is no longer the true thing. You, even if you have a coherent uh, uh, traditional exterior, if you have a concrete or an, a steel structure working inside, you have a real problem. It, it causes a terrible damage to buildings. And that's unfortunately when you get involved with building, which uh, a problem which you have to, to meet. Uh, this is a project I did in Italy with Tagliaventi in, in Alessandria. I did the master plan, then lost control over the architecture. But even with all the mistakes, you know, the, the detailed mistakes when you, are, you know about it's still a viable thing. Uh, Justice Palace in Luxembourg I did with my brother. The, my brother had this concept, the palace, and I had this small city, and this one, we, this was built, I got out because state architects are criminals, and uh, it was impossible to do it really correctly. Uh, but it's built, and it, it really works, that a, la a very large institution should not be one building, but usually is made of very small elements, like you know, the Cour Suprême, Tribunal d'Arrondissement, uh, tribunal de Jeunesse, and so on. Different functions which are not related to each other. They just need to be around one campus. And so on. Uh, now, one more project is uh, Torbella Monaca in Italy. And this project was commissioned by Mayor Alemano, an ex-fascist, but then he went to Israel to repent and to uh, was no longer anti-Semite. And after me, when I presented this to 3,000 people, the, the chief rabbi of Rome was speaking to show that we are friends. And, but the audience was not friendly. And, um, and Alemano was accused of many things. But he was, he was a very good client for this, because he wanted this Torbala Monaco, which is an absolute nightmare of uh, 60s, 80s mass housing, which is really terribly damaged, to replace it by buildings uh, with, with mixed population rather than with, uh, with only poor, which is outside Rome, called Torbella Monaca. And the first scheme was meant to be, uh, because there was so much empty space around that we would f build the first quarter where then people would be housed there and then we would destroy the existing buildings and then build there and so on. So you didn't have to displace the population. Now this was in, in the context of really reforming the, uh, the whole banlieue, the whole uh, suburre of, of Rome, which is in a terrible state. And because he had an, um, a statistician uh, a study how much different families, individuals spend per day in public transport. And for the lower and poor class, it's absolute catastrophe. The amount of time and money they spend in moving. So, the idea is, rather than of them all moving to the EU or the center of Rome, to build, turn, uh, transform the uh, suburbe into a real uh, number of cities, independent cities. And this became the project for Bala Monaca. Um, and this went into terrible opposition. Uh, it was never published. No, I, I used to be one of the most published people, architects in Italy. I couldn't help it, because I didn't, you know, Contos Pazio and uh, all the magazines published 20 pages, 30 pages, 50 pages. No problem. I never asked to be published. Uh, I sent them when they asked me. But here, I tried to publish this now for five years in Italy. Not one magazine has published a single picture of that project, which was a big official project. So you're talking about mafia, you know. And the mayor is now considered to be mafioso, but he was the only honest person I met there. The administration was highly mafioso, and so on. And so far, nothing is done. And it's, it's in the, the university did an, a special seminar, not inviting me, 
to save Torba la Monaca, this beautiful, incredible work of socialism built on the outskirts of Rome, is an unspeakable slum and for the poor. And need, something needs to be done because it's too expensive to maintain. It's mass housing which the, the buildings crack everywhere. So we created this palazzina. The palazzina is the building type for the Roman bourgeoisie, s'il vous plaît. Pas pour les pauvres. Uh, all of uh, Parioli and the whole, the beautiful outskirts of Rome are built with this building type, which is about 20 by 25 or 25 by 30, or those kind of dimensions, three to four floors. Uh, you know the buildings by you know, the famous architects uh, who built that way. The problem with those is that they are suburban. And usually in the space in between, there are ramps for the garages. Uh, we include the ramps inside the, the building. And uh, they are either parking per palazzina or uh, for a whole block, which is made of four or six or eight of these palazzine. And then within the perimeter of the block, you can have play areas or, or, or purely pedestrian areas and so on. And then the rich of course, live on the top floor, s'il vous plaît, and uh, lower income on the lower floor, but they mix. Um, and all of this was uh, properly done and, and presented to the most hostile audience I've ever met. And they were all room developers and uh, you know, chic people of the uh, bourgeoisie of, of Rome. And they don't like the poor to live the way they do. So nothing, nothing happened. Uh, and I have been banned from publishing in Italy. <laughs> I've been trying to publish this in Italy now for five years. It was published in England and, and in, in Spain, but not one single image in, in Italy. Voila. This is a project which is getting built in, uh, in uh, Guatemala, called Cayala, and with two major architects called Pedro and Maria Godoy. Pedro Godoy and Maria Sanchez, who are students of the uh, Notre Dame School of Architecture in uh, Indiana. And it's the only school of architecture in the world which teaches as a curriculum classical architecture. But classical architecture, not with dates and names and you know, all the boring stuff you have to learn, but technically, how to do it. How is it done properly, technically? And um, because in order, we are we are forced to build fakes. Most of our buildings are fakes. They are not true traditional buildings because we just can't afford it. The industry doesn't work that way. But in order to do a believable fake, which is beautifully proportioned, beautifully engineered so it doesn't crack and it ages well, people do inside what they want. Just crap, horrible. People have no taste in England. Terrible. Only the upper class have good taste. But at least outside, it's very civilized. No. But in order to do a fake traditional building, which is properly engineered and is not going to crack, it's much more difficult than when you are in a traditional. People think it's the easy way. Oh, he wants to do traditional art. It's too easy. It's much more difficult than to do, the modern, that, to do this kind of thing. Because this is what the industry produces even without you architects drawing it. No, they know how to do it. But to do... Uh, no, proper building, and this is an industry, all these buildings are built in concrete, massive concrete, because it's a uh, high, very lot of uh, earthquakes. And in order to, to get that right formally, it's much more difficult than to do, you know, just let it happen, as the industry does. And it's getting built and has enormously success, and, uh, and it's working. And finally I got my Palazzine Romane built the way I wanted it. But now, they are two floors too high. They were meant to be three, three and a half stories, 3.5. Uh, three stories with a penthouse, and now they are four and six, and so I resigned. The resignation has not yet been accepted, and so... This is always. When you do a job, you resign, and then finally the client, if he understands, that's fine, you go back. If he doesn't, you just quit. And we are building even a cathedral, because there people still believe in Jesus Christ and Holy Mary and all that. No. 
they still go to church massively. And the rich people go to church, not the poor. And they build now this cathedral. The, this is just the... No, sorry. Uh, on, this is just the chapel behind. You see the people? I mean, that's just the chapel. Now the main church is built with the dome. So, that's it, folks. Ah, no, yes, that's it. <laughs>